So let's start off with sympathomimetics. This is a pretty easy one to understand. All the sympathomimetics do is upregulate the sympathetic nervous system. So basically, they increase the heart rate, increase the blood pressure, generally produce sinus tachycardia, although in high doses, they can also precipitate tachyarrhythmias. They don't do a whole lot to respiration, although some patients may present with tachypnea, and many patients will present with hyperthermia, largely due to the motor activity and agitation associated with uh, sympathomimetic ingestions. When you examine the pupils on these patients, they'll be midriatic, so their pupils will be very large. Their skin may be normal, but diaphoresis is quite common, and their secretions are generally going to be normal. So again, this is a pretty easy toxidrome to understand. It basically involves upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, fast heart rate, high blood pressure, um, medriasis, but generally not a lot of effects on skin or secretions. By contrast, we have the anticholinergic toxidrome. So as you can imagine, when you block the parasympathetic nervous system, you're going to have unopposed sympathetic innervation. So a lot of the features of the anticholinergic toxidrome are similar to sympathomimetics. You're gonna have a fast heart rate, a high blood pressure, a rapid cardiac rhythm, and in some cases you may have tachyarrhythmias. Generally not a lot of effect on respiration, but very commonly an elevated temperature. This is actually an important feature of anticholinergic toxicity. Much like patients with uh, sympathomimetic uh, exposure, you're going to have medriasis, so large pupils. However, this is where it gets different. So these patients lose cholinergic innervation to the skin and the mucosa, so they're going to have dry skin, and more importantly, they're going to have almost no secretion. So they're going to have a dry mouth. They're going to have no tears. They're going to appear clinically uh, to be very dehydrated. So there's a mnemonic for the anticholinergic toxidrome. toxidrome. It's mad as a hatter, because these patients will all have altered mental status and agitation. Blind as a bat, which refers to the very dilated pupils. Red as a beet, which refers to the skin flushing that you commonly see in patients with anticholinergic ingestions. Hot as a hair, and I'm not really sure why hairs are so hot, but this refers to the dry skin and the elevated body temperature. And then lastly, dry as a bone. So these patients will have dry mucous membranes um, and a lack of uh, oral and ocular secretions. Now, it might not surprise you to hear that the cholinergic toxidrome is pretty much the opposite of the anticholinergic toxidrome. So these patients will have a slow heart rate, a normal to low blood pressure. They'll typically be in sinus bradycardia. Arrhythmias are very unusual with this toxidrome. They're going to have some degree of respiratory depression, typically a pretty normal temperature, although they might be on the low side. And their pupils are going to be meiotic, so their pupils will be constricted, small. So this is a really important differentiating feature of the cholinergic toxidromes. These patients will be wet, so their skin will be profusely diaphoretic, and their secretions will be copious. You'll see lots and lots of secretions in the mouth. You'll see lots of tearing. And that's because that's what the parasympathetic parasympath nervous system does. It basically innervates all of the parts of the body uh, that produce secretions. And you can easily remember the cholinergic toxidrome by thinking about fluids pouring out of every orifice. So there's a mnemonic for the cholinergic toxidrome that includes salivation, copious oral secretions, lacrimation, copious tearing, urination, these patients will commonly be incontinent of urine, defecation or diarrhea, and unfortunately that's an area where they're often incontinent as well, GI dysmotility, and emesis. So basically you can imagine there's something or other pouring out of every orifice in this patient. There's another mnemonic um, which some people prefer that is, includes diarrhea, urination, meiosis or muscle weakness, bronchorrhea, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. Now, whether or not you use these mnemonics or however you think of the anticholinergic toxidrome, an easy way to remember it, again, is if they have copious secretions, if there's fluid pouring out of every orifice, you want to be thinking about the cholinergics.
All right, the sedative hypnotics are pretty easy to understand because what they do is cause sedation. Um, so somnolence is gonna be the primary hallmark. These patients sometimes can be so deeply sedated that they lose their airway protective reflexes. So you do need to consider the possibility of intubation in some cases. And respiratory depression might also occur. So sometimes these patients require mechanical ventilation. There's not a lot of autonomic effects associated with the uh, sedative hypnotics, but remember, patients often take multiple drugs at the same time, so they may have autonomic uh, effects related to co-ingestions or other things that they took along with their sedative uh, ingestion. Opioids are very similar to the sedative hypnotics in that they produce somnolence, however, um, they universally produce meiosis. So opioids are a very powerful pupillary constrictor. And when you see pinpoint or very constricted pupils, you should always think about opioids. The other thing to remember about opioids is that uh, they very commonly cause respiratory depression. Um, so patients can come in apneic or with respiratory rates that are significantly low, and this can be a fatal event. So for these patients, we need to be pretty aggressive about treating them and restoring their normal respiration in order to save their lives. All right, so here's a review of the toxidromes, and I'm going to highlight some of the things that differentiate them so you can remember. Sympathomimetics, these patients will present hypertensive and tachycardic, and typically their mental status will be agitated. Anticholinergic patients will look a lot like sympathomimetic patients, except they will have very dry skin, very dry secretions. By contrast, our cholinergic patients will be copiously wet. They'll have diaphoretic skin, they'll have um, uh, increased secretions, and they typically will be somnolent rather than agitated. Our sedative hypnotic patients will of course be sedated, and our opioid patients will also be sedated. However, they'll present with meiosis and respiratory depression. So hopefully this will help you keep different clinical syndromes associated with different classes of drugs straight and allow you to rapidly narrow your toxicologic differential when you're faced with a patient who has an exposure.